Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to our continuing story of Pensacola, Florida, North America's first place city. And in this episode, we begin a, the examination of Pensacola's love affair with the automobile. Now, we, in, in, in the 21st century, we look about and we know that in Escambia County, for example, we have something in excess of 300,000 people. And people today, many folks know that traffic becomes difficult at times, but no, a few, few people recognize that we have well over 200,000 motor vehicles in use either by residents or, or, or individuals and families, but also in commerce. Two, over 200,000 vehicles. So I want to turn the, pack, the, uh, the calendar back a little over 100 years to about the turn of the 20th century. Now at this point, just about the year 1900, a number of great events were in progress. Bear in mind that to that point, people everywhere were basically dependent on the horse or their legs or the bicycle to move from place to place if they were going short distances. Uh, the idea of being able to move quickly had, well, it just had never, never matured. People didn't even dream in, that in those terms. But then, first of all, in Europe, a man by the name of Carl Benz, and then in uh, Massachusetts, a man named Charles Duryea began experimenting with what we ca came to know, of course, as the internal combustion engine. And the first automobiles took form. Now they were they were strange looking things. Well, usually a, an automobile in those early days looked like a buggy with the with an engine tacked onto it some way, and the the, the the machinery was very unreliable. But step by step, year by year, it became much more uh, much more effective. And by the year 1900, a man by the name of Ransom Olds in the uh, Detroit area was beginning to manufacture a reasonably uh, suitable, not only suitable, dependable automobile, and it was being sold for what was then you know, well not not an exorbitant in price. Ransom Olds, of course, was a not only a manufacturer but a, a race driver so that he uh, he was the, 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 the flagship idea of what but the automobile might become. When we move into the first first few years of the 20, 20th century and a whole host of men and companies come into being to manufacture vehicles. By the time we reached 1906, for example, there, there were about 20 uh, that had vehicles that they were very proud of and so in, in that year the first uh, coast to coast uh, championship race was conducted, and were, all of these uh, organizations, all these automobiles, and their drivers uh, 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 organized themselves, uh, got set to uh, to move east out of the city of San Francisco. It took it took almost six weeks for the Packard automobile to become the champion, arriving in in one piece in New York City. But that race, uh, even though the the time today seems extraordinary, helped to point out all sorts of things that the that our country needed if the auto automobile was going to take a, a become a prominent part of life, as everyone felt that it must be. And of course, this meant that we had to Im vastly improve our roads and our highways and our streets. And secondly, we had to find ways of crossing over the many, many rivers and streams that, that w inter interfered along the way. And in our own community, in, in the uh, uh, Scambia County, by, uh, <clears throat> into, shortly into this century, the, the idea of paving a street or a, or a road was just coming into fact. Most of the streets that we had here, except for, for Palafox and Garden, were, were basically just uh, formed of clay and sand and kept smooth by, by periodic scraping. So there, all of this had to happen. Well, Pensacola people, of course, were very interested in the automobile, and probably, the, the, again, this is a probable, probably one or two were brought here for demonstrations. It is probable that Olds uh, sent a car here and that others did as well, so people could get an idea of what they were like and people became excited. And the story goes, and I, I believe this is correct, that the first automobile was purchased here by the Hilton Green family. And supposedly it was a green uh, 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 Pierce Arrow automobile and the arrival was 1906. And again, the story, and we, we aren't sure that this is 100% true, but the story goes that Mrs. Hilton Green thus became the first local person to drive an automobile. The story goes that the Hilton Greens uh, held a party at, our, at their house and invited friends who had no idea that they had, the automobile had arrived and that in the middle of the afternoon Mrs. Hilton Green came driving up to the front and here she was behind the wheel and of course immediately offered her friends a, a first test drive and so things began. Well we did not get our first 
automobile franchise in Pensacola until 1910. There were one or two abortive efforts, but they just never came to pass. But in 19, 1910, a man by the name of Leonard Bradley, along with several associates, rented a what had been a, a grocery store on North Balin Street and began and opened up what they called uh, Bradley Motor Company. Now the Bradley was selling the Maxwell and the Cadillac automobiles. These were top of the line cars. These were expensive automobiles, but the uh, the Bradleys and the and the Bradley and his associates reckoned that at the, by this time people were making money in the uh, in the uh, lumbering business to a great degree, and there were no taxes, of course. That that the Maxwell and, and the uh, and the uh, Cadillac were dependable cars, and they would sell them. And so they opened their showroom. They had a mechanical shop in the back. Uh, but bear this in mind now, uh, supposing you had uh, decided to buy one of those cars, the next question was, where are you going to get fuel and, and petroleum products to go with it? Because the, uh, the dealer did not have them, and the, certainly there were no gas stations along the way, no convenience stores that carried gasoline. So basically, what you had to do was to drive to the closest blacksmith shop, and there were still three in the city that were willing to, to open a, to have a, a supply of, uh, of gasoline, and they would literally have this, not in, not in, underground tanks but in large 55 gallon drums so that you would drive your car up there and that literally by hand would pump uh, gasoline through a hose from the from their uh, from their 55 gallon container into the into the automobile so that's the way it all began uh, now th three years before this in 1907 uh, Henry Ford had uh, gone had gone into pr into production of what became known of course as the famous Model T Ford had, had several earlier attempts at cars which had been made and tried and just had not made it. But Henry Ford by 1907 had a new concept and that was that he was going to utilize a, a, a division of labors along his uh, production line and so be able to make a dependable automobile that was uh, low in price and could be easily afforded by most of the Americans who wanted that kind of transportation. Now, we did not have a Ford dealership in uh, the Pensacola area for several years, but finally, the Anderson family purchased that dealership, and they were they again were among the first few uh, auto dealerships that we had here. But they they went on, they bought this, and uh, they re remained in the business for seven years. And then in uh, 1924, the Mulden family, James Mulden and his son, acquired the that dealership, and so be, this is when Mulden Ford began. Now, of course, as we move along, other others are coming along. We begin to see uh, people coming along to uh, to uh, to do the the uh, to add additional dealerships. We began to see people selling such things as the as the Stutz, as the Maxwell, as we mentioned the Maxwell before, the, the Nash, the Hudson, the Essex. Uh, all of these become new cars online and shortly thereafter they, here come the Studebakers and of course we, be, we develop a Packard relationship here. And basically what we had in the early days in Pensacola, and this was this was fairly fairly standard across the country. Many of the dealerships that opened would have a shop. They would usually uh, occupy what had been a, a a small shop up and down Palafox or Garden or one of the other uh, streets of the co commercial area. They would have an office there, and maybe maybe they would have one vehicle that they could show and and, and give test rides. Now all of the other things that one might uh, might do in, in ordering an automobile had to be done out of catalogs. In other words, you could look at the at one catalog that, that detailed the colors of the car. But there were very few choices really because at first almost all of them were painted black. But nonetheless, you if you wanted a, a certain type of upholstery, if you wanted a different kind of covering of your, for your car, you would order this not by having seen it on the showroom or a showroom floor or in, in a lot, but basically basically out of a book. And now you ordered your car, and uh, Mr. Smith, the, the dealer, would take the order carefully. It would be sent to Detroit, and then it would be brought to Pensacola on the railroad. And the railroad, of course, brought it right uh, into the center of the city, was unloaded, taken to the dealership for final polishing, and that was that. Now, if you happen to be living not in Pensacola, but over in, uh, over, let's say, in, in, uh, in uh, Panama City or, or St. Andrews or places, or Carabelle, and you wanted a car, you made the trip to Pensacola went to the dealer, made the same order or uh, uh, purchase arrangement, and the car arrived. But then to get your car 
to, uh, from Pensacola to your home, to your city, you used the steamship Tarpon because there was no highway connecting all of these towns along the Gulf. Uh, the only, only really uh, delivery mechanism we had, and this would be true for over 30 years, was the steamship Tarpon. And that's the way most of the cars that went to those areas, or virtually all of the cars that went there, were delivered. Okay, now other things, of course, were needed. By the time we get into the middle of the second decade of the 20. 20th century. All sorts of other things are, are needed because now more and more people are buying automobiles. The city, the city council itself is, is beset with many, many requests that we've got to have better streets and better roads so that, we, so that the things are, are comfortable for us. And then, of course, in addition to that, you, you want to have the, all the convenience of, of the specialty services. Where, where can you buy a battery? Where can you get a tire fix? Where can you buy a new inner tube for your tire? And so basically beginning in the mid teens, mid 19 teens, we see organizations started such as the one that was begun by a man named John H. Sherrill. Now, Mr. Sherrill had come to Pensacola in 1903 to be head of the YMCA, and he was a, a very successful, much beloved man. Uh, he left that uh, work in 1915 uh, to take an opportunity with a, a large uh, moving and storage company because his, he was finding that he could not support his family at the Y. But he was only with the storage company a short time when the Pure Oil Company out of Texas came to Mr. Sherrill and said, we will, we will help you establish yourself as a dealer. And Mr. Sherrill thus became the head of the local pure oil uh, franchise area and, and Sherrill Oil Company came into being and very quickly he established service stations in Pensacola itself and then to, over his franchise area to the east and then north of, into areas of, uh, of South Alabama. So for, uh, for, now Front of Sherrill was only one of such uh, uh, agencies to serve that way. Others came along as well uh, representing the Sinclair uh, Refining Company, the Gulf Oil Company and so on. And of course as, the, as these ca companies came into being we must remember that we they were still without good highways going east and west or north and south so that all of the product that they were to sell had to come by water. And as this happened, of course, we had to build additional facilities or they had to build additional facilities along our, our port, along our waterfront, and they put on their, up their storage tanks and the docks at which the barges would, 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 be, would be tied up when they, when they came into the city. So we see all of those things happening. Now, uh, let's assume now you, you've got your new car. And we're moving now, let, let's say we're up to 1920, and you bought your new Dodge Brothers sedan, and of course, you want to enjoy it. And one of, the, one of the things, of course, that people in the community did that they, they bought those cars was to enjoy particularly Sunday afternoon or Saturday afternoon family outings in the car, uh, just driving around, because there, there were very few ways in which you could move outside the city and, and with any safety and comfort. So you were strictly pretty much within the city. But as you did this, of course, you wanted to be fashionable. Now, most of the early cars, and this would be up to about 1920, most of them were, were fairly open in their, in their, in their manufacturing uh, state. Uh, they, they didn't have the closed body that we enjoy in our cars today. So basically, the women in particular wanted to be, protect themselves against the dust of the unpaved street. So women would, bu would buy these very beautiful dusters. They would have a particular cap that would go over the top of their head and would be tied below because if they didn't do that, they, they might lose it by uh, having it blow off. The men, the, the drivers themselves, they had special caps that they wore. Many of them wore goggles as they traveled, and of course, almost Almost all of them had a, a, a set of gloves that they wore because many times in the course of driving the car they would have to d get out of the vehicle, make some adjustment underneath the hood, perhaps even change a tire because in those first years a, a, a new tire, particularly take one for example that was done by the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, they were guaranteed for 5,000 miles. That didn't mean they weren't going to suffer a puncture along the way, uh, the inner tube being punctured by some obstruction in the road, but nonetheless the guarantee was for 5,000 miles. So many of mo every motorist that was on the road at that time had to learn how to take care of all the simple motoring things. Uh, he had to be uh, able to head. It was, a, it was a standard procedure when you were go out going off with the family. The first thing you did was make sure you had water in the radiator, oil in the, in the, uh, in the crankcase, and then of course uh, had gasoline there. And, and you're, uh, when, you, when you went to the station, if or the blacksmith in the early days, and you wanted to add gasoline. Uh, the early cars, literally the gasoline tank was accessible underneath the driver's seat. So they had to move that back, put the gasoline in, put the seat back, and they were ready to travel. So you can see automobile driving up to the, about the year 1920 was a hazard, was it was fun, but it was just the beginning. And that's our story in episode one.